I'm Roger Crom. I'm a professor here at the University of Colorado Boulder. I operate the Locomotion Lab and we study how people walk, run, and ride bikes. So I've been studying the biomechanics of cycling, running, and walking since 1983. About three years ago we were interested in measuring the power dissipated by the suspension system when you're riding, riding a bike uphill. And we used a crank spider-based power meter to measure that mechanical power loss. It worked well, but we wanted to develop the gravity-based treadmill method so that we had a gold standard for uh, measuring the power output. Okay, in the gravity-based treadmill method, we incline our treadmill to a, a very specific angle. We measure the weight of the rider and the bike. Uh, we also measure the treadmill speed very accurately. So if we know the angle of the treadmill, and we know the speed of the belt, and we know the weight of the rider and the bike, we can uh, calculate mechanical power directly because mechanical power is equal to force times velocity. Because we just use gravity, we know the force very precisely. And this method can be used anywhere in the world because gravity is basically the same anywhere in the world. We also need to measure the rolling resistance of the bike. And we do that by hanging, uh, we attach a string to the bike and we pull exactly parallel to the treadmill with another again gravity based, we hang a weight over a pulley and we can uh, measure very accurately the force that's required to overcome the rolling resistance of the bike. We add those two factors together and that gives us the vertical power against gravity as well as the power to overcome the rolling resistance of the bike. On a treadmill there's no aerodynamic resistance. When you ride outside the wind is variable, the air density is variable. In, inside the lab we control for we don't have any air resistance factor to, to worry about. There's one other factor I want to mention, and that is that we have to take into account drivetrain losses. So the, the chain of a bicycle is very good at uh, being efficient, but it, everybody who measures it estimates that it's about 2% energy loss uh, in, in the drivetrain. So we multiply the power that we have times uh, uh, 1.02 to take into account that 2% drivetrain losses. Uh, I prefer this method because it's physics based. It doesn't require special equipment. It could be tested, it could be applied anywhere in the world uh, as long as you have a big enough treadmill and an accurate inclinometer to measure the angle of the treadmill. The gravity based treadmill method exactly replicates the way a, r a real human applies torque to the cr pedals and cranks of a bicycle because it is a real human turning the pedals in this testing. The alternative method is to use a motor-driven dynamometer, which applies a constant torque throughout the crank cycle. No human pedals that way, and so we like our method better because it's more like a real rider is going to, exp uh, is going to use their power meter when they're out on the road. The gravity-based treadmill method is not more accurate than a dynamometer, but it's more realistic. Gravity acts the same way inside our lab as it does outside on the road. The power that you apply to the cranks can either overcome gravity or overcome aerodynamic forces. It doesn't matter. Power is always going to be equal to force times velocity. Another advantage of the treadmill testing is that it's replicatable. So what we have done in the past is to simulate outdoor temperature fluctuations. We've had people ride on a bike with a set of power measuring cranks uh, at room temperature. And then we take the cranks off and put them in the freezer for an hour and have lunch. We put the cranks back on and measure the power. Uh, we can simulate riding outside in freezing conditions. Then we took the cranks off the bike and we put them in a styrofoam box and poured hot lead pellets over the cranks until the cranks got up to uh, you know, 130, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we took them out and rode the bike as quickly as we could. So we could simulate how fluctuations in temperature uh, affect the, the accuracy of the power meter, but we were doing it in controlled conditions. Whereas if we were outside, we couldn't control the power demand of riding outside because the wind might change and, and we wouldn't be able to actually have a gold standard for the power that was being put in. We've used this method to test pedal-based power meters. We've used it to test uh, crank spider-based power meters. We've used it to test hub-based power meters. And in fact, with our method, you could also put the power measuring pedals on power measuring cranks and put a power measuring hub on the back wheel and measure all three at, uh, at once if you wanted to. So power meters are a pretty big investment for a rider. If you're going to spend hundreds of dollars on a power meter, I, I would, you would want to have, know that it's accurate, precise, and reliable, or at least know how accurate, precise, and reliable it is. If you buy downhill ski bindings, you know that they're going to release 
a, for a given setting because they're certified and they're standardized. Where there are no industry standards for power meter testing out there, and so it's kind of the wild west. So a leading bike manufacturer contracted 4i to make their uh, power meters that they install on bikes, and they asked us to figure out a method to test to validate their power meters before they uh, committed to the contract. So we, we started testing power meters for that company, and uh, then 4i has reached out to us to test the, their own branded power meters, and we're happy to test anybody's power meters. So what I admire about the 4i company is that they came to me and they said, uh, we would like you to test our power meters. Other companies have their own testing protocols and they make their own claims, but 4i came to me and said, we want you to objectively test our power meters and tell us what the numbers are. They took those numbers and they went back to the drawing board and improved their product. I hope that other power meter companies also come to me and that we can become the standard testing lab for the industry. We'd be happy to do that and we think that we're objective and, and we know that we're careful and precise. We don't really have a, a dog in the fight. Our dog is uh, Isaac Newton in physics. We, we want to use a, a reliable scientific method to, to validate these devices. We hope to work with other power meter manufacturers to, so that consumers can get a, an accurate number when they, they'll know what they're buying when they uh, buy, invest in a power meter. So what I envision for the future is that uh, the industry and in, a company would provide the funding. We would go and buy units off the shelf so that it's exactly what a consumer would buy. We'd test them in the lab. We'd uh, produce a, a report and put it up for, for the public uh, on the internet. And then we uh, could uh, sell those cranks basically back to the manufacturer so that uh, they'd reimburse us for the uh, purchase of the cranks and give, we'd give them back. Um, what that would do is it would make the process independent. Rather than having the company supply 10 cranks that are their best 10 cranks, instead we're, we're sampling what's available on the marketplace. So we have a simple, reliable, physics-based method for uh, validating power meters. I would think that legitimate power meter manufacturers would have no problem with their devices being tested. In fact, they'd be proud of the results. So uh, I hope that other companies want to have their power meters tested and then the consumers can decide based on uh, real numbers.